there was a very um, consistent, well-structured uh, paradigm on how things, load growth was, uh, load was growing very rapidly. Utilities were vertically in integrated. If you went to one geographic area, one company ran the, uh, generated the power, just transmitted it, distributed it. So it was a simple model. The, uh, uh, the problem was completely inverted from what it is now in one important sense. The problem in those days was finding a good location for a power plant. Cook a good cooling water, reasonably close to load, uh, good proximity to fuel, and cooling water, basically. Once you found, once the utility found a local, a good power station site within their territory or in someone else's, uh, the problem of transmitting power was completely secondary. It was inexpensive. If you needed the lines, you built them. Today, the problem's completely re inverted. Uh, you can't find sites for power plants very easily. I, I'm sorry, you can't, you can't build transmission lines very easily. So now the network is fixed and you install a plant where, it, where you can find a location for it to fit in the network. So the priorities have completely changed. Uh, apart from the, also the addition and the change in uh, deregulation where the markets are separated. In any case, uh, in those days, as I mentioned, the, the problems were mainly addressed without uh, computers. And I got um, assigned to what was called a transient network analyzer. Now in those, this of course is the uh, 50s, this was long before digital computers. So that when large, <clears throat> large networks, uh, multi, st the, the electric power lines that link several states, to solve a problem like that, you stood in front of a uh, uh, panel that looked like an old telephone operator's panel that was probably uh, in a room something like uh, 20 by 40 or 50 feet and you actually plugged together a model of the system. And each plug represented a power line and inside the box was an electrical model of the power line. And in front of each generating station there was a meter. So everything was miniaturized, but it was all analog. And if you plugged it together wrong, it might take you three days to realize why the numbers were funny. It was a, but it was a state of the art. That was one analyzer. That was not the one I spent most of my time on. I spent my time in a, a real fun shop, which was called a transient network analyzer. The transient analyzer didn't look at the normal steady state operation of the system, but it looked at surges when switches closed, what happened to the surges throughout the system. When lightning struck a uh, line, what happened? So it was the transient or very short time domain type problem. And the transient analyzer really wasn't an analyzer at all. It was a, a room full of toys, uh, models of a transformer, models of a capacitor, models of power lines, just little pieces. So that when you addressed a problem that hadn't been solved before, you just connected everything up and actually caused a switch to close to see what happened. When that switch closed, of course, you would see some kind of transient on an oscillograph. But in order to make that recur, the switch was on a drum. So we had a me mechanical drum with part of the surface conducting, part not, so that transient recurred repetitively and it looked like it stood still on the uh, screen. 
Uh, I, I can't imagine having more fun in, in, uh, in my life. We just uh, looked into all sorts of new things. This was the first work on ferromagn ferromagnetic oscillations. Uh, it was a field day for writing IEEE papers because everything we did was new. And I was uh, one happy cat until I was told that the vacancy, which I was waiting for, was open and that I could go, by which time, by the way, I had settled into Schenectady and liked it here. I liked the skiing, I liked the sailing. So when I was told that I, I could now go on to the application engineering program and prepare myself to be shipped to Des Moines, Iowa or wherever, I was appalled. And I went into my, uh, the manager of analytical engineering, uh, Selden Crary, uh, if tears weren't in my eyes, they almost were, and appealed to him to stay where I was. And he said, well, he says, if you think you can look at all the stuff that's been written, all these equations that you're surrounded by, and assume they're either all wrong or inadequate, then you belong here. And I said, I believe. <laughs> So that began uh, a wonderful career. It was a good choice. Uh, and after that, the, um, that was at the time when the first rumblings were coming around concerning the use of computers to solve these problems. They were first called, they were first card program calculators where you punched a whole bunch of cards and fed them into a machine. Uh, and during the uh, late 50s, uh, I think it was, there was really quite a debate as to whether the digital computer would ever take over the job that this, uh, this uh, analog analyzer did. Well, history has shown what happened now. What used to be a difficult job a two-day job to assemble uh, a system with 100 or 200 generators is now a 10-minute job to assemble uh, a thou thousands of generators now in the whole United States because of the capacity of digital programs. But that was the end of an era of analog solutions. It was a it was a wonderful uh, period of time because. Uh, so many of the problems, uh, so many of the, the solutions, and so much of the understanding that we have now was being developed. Uh, and developed without the help of, uh, of sophisticated simulation. Uh, I could give you an example. Uh, people were very concerned about a better understanding of how uh, lightning affected power lines. Uh, lightning comes down out of the sky, hits the, uh, the uh, transmission line because it's very high, good target for lightning. The two top wires on the line are there specifically to catch the lightning. They're grounded and conducted to ground. But the question was how did how did that lightning stroke, when it hit the tower, still cause the uh, power line to flash over to the short circuit? Uh, well, we, we uh, worked with John Anderson uh, in, in uh, Pittsfield, still a very active guy on this, and we decided that the way to learn the, get the answer was to uh, build our own lightning stroke. So we built a box about this big. And inside it, we put a very, very simple switch that was on, off, on, off, and created a very steep 
uh, wavefront. This little box we took out to Detroit. We had uh, either rented or bought a World War II barrage balloon. A barrage balloon is a big balloon that goes up on a wire to prevent planes from flying low. And they were army surplus, they were pretty cheap. We had, they have clearance with the, uh, the uh, airport to tell them we were going to send us up in the sky. Halfway up the wire was this box, and then the balloon was on top. The box was already turned on and it was turning on and off and on and off and on and off and up and it went. It was tied to the tower and we had instrumented, the tower of course was taken out of service, but we had instrumented and measured the voltage across the insulators. And this was a model because one, if it's a linear problem, so what the solution for one volt was one millionth of what it would be for a million volts. So we, and that was the first understanding of that coupling between lightning and the tower, stuff like that. There, all of that was going on at that period of time. Now, now simulated uh, much more simply by digital computer. Mm -hmm.